Good evening, everybody. We'll get started in just a minute or two. I know that can be a little tricky getting in through Eventbrite when you've signed up for something. So we'll get a hold for just a minute or two and then jump right in. Well, it's 7.01, so I'll go ahead and get started. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the March uh, professional lecture for the Bowen Center. Uh, my name is Kathleen Smith, and I'm an associate faculty member at the Bowen Center. And I am very pleased to introduce our um, speaker tonight. But first, before I read his bio, I just want to remind everyone that we will leave discussion for the end. Um, we don't use the chat function for the lectures. We'll give you an opportunity to use the raise hand button to uh, voice your question. And so if you'll look down at the reactions bar, uh, either at the bottom or the top in Zoom, if you'll click on that, you'll see a little raised hand icon and you can click on that to ask a question. And we will leave time for discussion at the end. So I think that's the only technical thing we have to co uh, cover. If everybody can also just make sure that you're muted if you're not, uh, that would be very helpful for us. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, introduce our speaker for tonight. So John Bell, uh, who's an MDiv, is an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church, where he has served uh, for 28 years and is a faculty member at the Center for Family Consultation in Evanston, Illinois. He's been teaching and applying the principles of Bowen theory for over 20 years, and he also completed three years in the postgraduate program uh, in Bowen theory at the Bowen Center uh, here in Washington, D.C., in addition to his work in his local church, his effort to understand theory continues through research, writing, blogging, teaching, and coaching individuals, families, clergy, and congregations. Uh, John is married with three children and currently serves Wesley United Methodist Church in Aurora, Illinois. And he's also one of the, probably the first person I thought of when I was trying to put together a lineup for the lecture series this year. Because I don't think, I, I mean, I haven't been around the Bowen Center that long, but I don't think we've ever had anyone present on running for political office. So uh, during the discussion time, if I'm wrong, somebody can jump in and, and correct me on that. But I thought it was such a unique topic. Uh, and, and to hear from somebody who's bringing uh, the lens of Bowen family systems theory to thinking about that kind of, that first of all, that process and also uh, serving in that kind of leadership position. So I'm really interested in hearing uh, what John has to say tonight about that. And hopefully you all have some some good questions for him as well. So John, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you to jump in and tell us about this, this interesting journey that you had and the, and the thinking you brought to it. Okay. Thank you, Kathleen. Well, hello. You can hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, tonight, I'm just going to outline uh, my presentation for tonight, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the facts and history about Aurora, the city I live in. I'm going to talk a little bit about my family and their political involvement over the years. I'm going to talk a little bit about the events that led up to my decision to run for office. I'll talk about the campaign, being on the campaign trail, and then I'm going to end uh, with my thinking about how how I have thought about navigating political life from a framework of differentiation of self and Bowen theory. Um, but I, I really wanna start with a couple of disclaimers. Um, the first disclaimer is that I, 
I ran for alderman in Aurora, Illinois in 2020, and I did not win the election. So <laughs> what I'm presenting tonight is my thinking about elections and politics based on my experience, but I never got to test out my ideas uh, or run my experiments. Uh, but I'm, I am gonna talk about some of those at the end, what I was hoping to accomplish. Um, the second thing is I, I am a pastor. So th this is the first time publicly I've talked about campaigning. Um, and so I think you're going to hear the challenges that I face in, in thinking systems about campaigns and politics and policy making. Um, and we can talk about those challenges at the end. Um, I'm, I'm certainly much more comfortable uh, talking about families or, or congregations. Uh, I'm, I'm still you know, working through my thinking about how one can actively participate in policy decisions while while working out of this framework of differentiation. So, um, but I'm I'm up for this challenge. I'm I'm so appreciative of the opportunity. So thank you, Kathleen, for the invitation uh, to present tonight. Uh, I'm a you know I, I am a United Methodist pastor, um, and United Methodists trace their roots through the Church of England and the Catholic Church. So I'm I'm Protestant, um, and I think it's important um, to know that I'm a pastor because as I talk through this. Um, clergy are kind of in a unique situation um, and unique position in society, um, and it's changed slightly in the past few decades, but not by much. Um, if I, I don't have it on tonight because I only wear it uh, when I when I really need need to on purpose. But um, I can put a collar on, which is like the white tab that some clergy wear uh, on their shirt, and um, or I can tell people I'm a pastor, and it gets me access to a lot of public and private spaces um, without much of an issue. So as a clergy person, I'm able to move between addressing policy issues in public spaces to addressing family issues in people's homes. So it's a really, it's been a very interesting vantage point to be in um, for all these years. I mean, one quick example of it is um, I was attending a city council meeting in 2019 because I was speaking up uh, on behalf of a mental health center that the city was trying to shut down. The, the mayor was objecting to the type of clients that were being served by this inpatient program in the downtown area. And so I, I spoke up in support of the center at the city council meeting, but sitting next to me during the meeting was this father with two kids. Uh, and at that same meeting, the mother of the two kids were being sworn in as a police officer and the kids uh, were preschool and early elementary age, and were just excited uh, to be there and to see their mom being sworn in. And the husband was clearly proud of his wife. Um, and I, you know, I got to chat with them after the meeting, offered up my congratulations. Um, but I, I do find that I'm, I'm always sort of navigating between sort of public places and, and sort of family spaces. So a little bit of background about, um, about Aurora. Uh, Aurora, Illinois is the second largest city in Illinois. Um, Aurora was the original home to Miami and Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Sac, and, Sac and uh, Fox Peoples. Um, and so in worship, uh, each Sunday we honor the fires that still burn and all who continue to call that this area here in Aurora home uh, who care for land and water. The Treaty of 1804 and the war that defeated uh, Chief Blackhawk um, allowed for white Europeans to migrate to Illinois. And, and actually the first two were brothers. Um, their last name uh, was McCarty's and, and they were actually Methodists. Um, they established the first Methodist church in town. Uh, they built um, a mill along the river that divides the, the city from east and west. Um, the east side of Aurora was established first and then the west side and the city government was established on an island actually on the Fox River between the east and west side in order to be a uh, neutral, uh, to be neutral between the two sides because they were very competitive over the years. Um, and that was established in 1857. Uh, the Chicago Burlington and Quincy Railroad uh, Company located its roundhouse and locomotive shop in Aurora, which was the largest employer at the time. And then manufacturing was the next biggest employer on the east side, which historically attracted many migrants or immigrants. 
in the 1970s and 80s, uh, most of those manufacturing jobs on the east side uh, uh, left. They closed down and moved out towards the edges of town. Some of them just left the city completely. And so unemployment went up, um, as did crimes of survival. Um, and as of the 2020 census, there were a hundred, a little over 180,000 people in Aurora. Um, the racial makeup of the city was uh, about 40 or 41 percent white, um, about 11 percent African American, um, almost 2 percent Native American, about 11 percent Asian, uh, 0.05 Pacific Islander, um, and then about 21 percent, 20 percent came from other races. Uh, and 15% from two or more races. So Hispanic or Latinos of any race um, were 41, 42% of the population, making them in the, the majority of the population. So there's been a, because of all of the decline in manufacturing um, and the economic decline in the city, the downtown area really suffered from all of this decline. Um, there's been a policy effort in Aurora city government to bring now investment dollars from outside of the city into the downtown area and into some of the business areas to build up its uh, industrial and sales tax base. And that redevelopment has started to significantly shift the population as more, um, I'd say, you know, expensive restaurants and stores begin to open. And then the cost of housing is going up and it's displacing now large portions of the population who can no longer afford to live in Aurora. And this population uh, that's being displaced has historically been the life force of the downtown area. Many, many of them are artists um, and those who work in service industry. Um, so that's a little bit about Aurora and, and the history of the town and the makeup of the city. Um, before I talk about my decision to run, I, I wanted to give you just a, a little bit of background about uh, my family. So I am the youngest of three brothers. My, my birth uh, followed the death of the second brother. Uh, on my uh, maternal side, my maternal grandfather worked in the sheriff's office uh, and then became sheriff of the county that they lived in for a term and then became a probationary officer. In fact, uh, my maternal grandfather was the first to be trained in the state uh, as a probation officer, he became, and, and then he became the first, second vice president, that makes sense, uh, of the state association for probation officers. Uh, in fact, there's an award that's named after him that I've had the opportunity to connect with the organization that gives out that award every year. Um, he was very active with his political party um, in his day. Um, he died when I was five, so I, I don't have much in terms of memories uh, of him, but he was very politically connected and active uh, in his life. Uh, my, my mother was also um, involved politically. Um, a, as a realtor, she served as the president of the association in her county uh, and served on a state task force for a few years that included regular trips to DC to lobby on behalf of the state. Um, and I can remember uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, um, we would take trips to D.C. Um, because she was lobbying for the for the state of Illinois. And I, I remember staying at the hotel that uh, then President Ronald Reagan, uh, he had just been shot at a month earlier. And we were we were there, I think, the month after that. Uh, we were there several times over the course of a few years. Um, I also remember as a child, my, my mother would take me to different events. Uh, she once took me to participate in a teacher strike. Uh, there were protests that went down the main street of our town when I was in elementary school. Teachers were striking, I think, for more money, for, uh, for a couple of other things. And I, I remember that she, she, went with, she took me there and we, we marched down the street. And then she used to take me to hear stump speeches uh, for presidential campaigns. Um, on my paternal side, my father was a lawyer. Um, uh, he's retired now. He helped shape laws and policies for the real estate industry, actually, in the state. Uh, and while he was never a judge, he did serve for many years on a review board for the state Supreme Court that would hear and recommend cases of attorney misconduct. 
Um, and those were some fairly uh, high profile cases that were happening in the state. So I, I kind of come out of a family that was uh, very engaged in politics uh, and policy was very interested in it. Um, I was always as a young kid sort of captivated by uh, being in courthouses and going to Capitol buildings and uh, meeting legislators. Uh, so it, it, I think it had an impact on me in my, in my life. Um, I've always had this interest in politics and public policy. I've always felt very comfortable around politicians and at government meetings. Um, and I've found ways over the years to use my position as a pastor to organize and promote and influence local, state, and federal policy decision makers. Um, so I, I want to shift gears and talk a little bit about my decision to, to run. Um, my, my, so I ran for this position of alderman in the ward that I live in, in Aurora. The, the current alderman had served uh, two terms. I think it was two, maybe been three. Um, and so he was the incumbent. Um, and I, I decided to run against them. Um, and I was the only person who ran this race against the incumbent. Um, my decision was in 2020. Uh, the election was in 2021. Um, and if you probably remember, things changed quite a bit in our country in 2020 um, for a number of reasons. Um, and, and Aurora certainly wasn't um, immune from it. Um, on, on May 25th, 2020, George Floyd, who was a 46-year-old Black man, was murdered in Minneapolis by Derek Chauvin, who was a 44-year-old white uh, police officer. Um, and the, the events, the images of Floyd on the ground with uh, Chauvin's knee on George's neck next to a squad car, you know, really shifted things in this country. And then protests uh, started to spring up in response across the country. And, and at the time, I had been in Aurora for about seven years. Um, and so in response to that in Aurora, uh, a march had been planned for the following Sunday. And it was to be a march from the police department to uh, down to the city hall, which was a, a pretty long march. Um, Elsa and I were out of town that weekend, but we shifted our schedules a little bit so that I could get back to join the, to join the march. And, and by the time I got back to Aurora that night, uh, the march had, it was late afternoon, the march had already made its way uh, and was close to City Hall. Uh, in fact, by the time I parked and, and got there, they were in front of City Hall. And, and when I arrived, there were about 500 people that were there. So it was a pretty, pretty good sized crowd. And it was a mix of individuals and families. And um, they had been met at City Hall with a militarized city and county police department. Um, and so the City Hall was surrounded by armed vehicles and officers in riot gear. Um, even though the march had been peaceful, was made up of individuals and families, and they were just making their way down to the downtown area. Um, the county sheriff was, um, was in an armored vehicle. Um, and was asking the crowd to disperse through a bullhorn that was attached uh, to that armored truck. Uh, so that was all taking place when I arrived. And, you know, at no time did the crowd have an uh, interaction with elected officials, um, even standing outside of City Hall, there were no like, official presence there. Um, you know, there was a time in Aurora where, you know, public safety was a concern. Um, there was a time when, you know, violent deaths were elevated, uh, particularly after the collapse of the manufacturing jobs on the east side. Um, but during my time there, in, in those seven years that I'd been in Aurora, there, there really wasn't much in terms of violent crime. The violent crime rate was, was going down. In fact, about a year or two before this event, um, the city had gone an entire year with no gun violence, which was pretty remarkable. Um, but um, so a crime was, you know, safety was not really a concern. I at no time really was concerned about my safety uh, there. So from my perspective, um, this was not a city that would, you know, where things would escalate quickly or um, it seemed like a disproportionate response to me, I guess, is what I'm saying to what was really happening. Clearly, though, like what was happening in, in, the, in the United States at the time, um, certainly. Um, would make it, um, you know, where people would think that it would be necessary. 
Um, so I was in my clergy attire because, you know, when I'm in situations um, where I'm, it's helpful to have access to people um, or to be able to navigate uh, spaces, I, I often, often wear it. Um, people have an emotional reaction to it, which is why I wear it. Um, it allows me access to places. It allows me the ability to move between police and protesters or marchers without a lot of questions or confrontations. It always surprises me that it's that way, but it it, it does. Um, I don't I don't think it's my smile. <laughs> uh, but the the military uh, presence that was there agitated that group of marchers. So um, the the leaders of the march started moving people by foot again, uh, but without really any clear direction, they just started moving. And then the police started closing streets. So they sort of directed the group to the, to the main street, which is a four lane road that goes through the east side of Aurora. And then the march then actually turned into a protest. Um, and there were probably about a dozen uh, people that started to actually break windows in the downtown area. And there, it was sort of sporadic. It it only happened to a couple of buildings. Um, it wasn't happening all the time, and it and it certainly wasn't um, like a constant thing. Um, and then there was this uh, group of of women who uh, older women who made their way over to this group and started to try to talk to them. Um, and they were providing leadership. They were trying to get this group to calm down and to stop breaking things, but. Um, but despite their efforts, um, the police decided to fire tear gas into the crowd. And so uh, that changed things very quickly. The crowd dispersed uh, and then I, my purpose kind of shifted and I started to take care of and tend the people who were overcoming tear gas, helping people make their way out of the downtown area. Uh, we were walking back, there was a, a young woman who broke open the window of a vacant police car, set it on fire. So, you know, things kind of escalated very quickly in a, in a matter of minutes. Um, and, and I really was surprised by all of that, but looking back on it, I probably shouldn't have been. Um, but it did kind of catch me by surprise. Uh, and really what was going on in my mind at the time, uh, at the moment was where where are the leaders or who are the leaders of this community um, that, you know, I realized that this was happening all around the country. Um, but in my context in Aurora, I, I was think, thinking that there seemed to have been a failure of leadership that um, the things had gotten to this to this place and that it had been happening over a period of time that we didn't just get there. Uh, but this had been sort of simmering for a while. So I decided to <laughs> I decided to make my way towards the police, um, who it, who again were in tactical gear and organized into teams. And again, you know, I'm I'm banking on the fact that they're not going to arrest me um, uh, with a collar on. So um, I just kind of rolled the dice and I uh, so I passed the teams. They were organized in teams, and and then I saw that one mother who had recently been hired as a police officer. The the one whose family I met at the city council meeting, and she just absolutely looked terrified. And I'll, I'll just never forget the look on her face and how scared, uh, how scared she looked. Um, and so I, I started walking towards my car, and I kept thinking to myself that there had to be a better way to do this, like a better way to solve these societal problems, and also the, these problems that also show up at a family level. And it probably isn't funny, but you know, as the police car was up in smoke and tear gas was was literally floating across the river in the downtown area, I was really trying to think about what Bowen theory or leadership rooted in Bowen theory looks like. Like, what what does theory actually add um, to this problem, um, and how do you think about that, and what do you do about that? Um, you know, one of the ways that communities sort out their problems and challenges is through good leadership that's present and accounted for and leans into problems and collaborates with other leaders. Um, it was clear to me that that march group that was leading that march did not have a clear leader. It was, it, the leadership was chaotic um, and they didn't really have a plan for what to do when they were at City Hall. And then the leadership of the city government was not present and accounted for, in my opinion. I, I remember thinking that, um, and again, this may sound funny, but I thought if I was the mayor of the town, I would have walked into that group smashing windows. 
um, probably with my collar on. I'm just kidding. But I, I would have gotten interested in what they were experiencing, and I would have tried to find time to meet and work on it. But I, I think I would have moved. I was was really actually in the process of moving towards that group, uh, considering moving towards that group when, when we were on the street before the tear gas started going. Um, because I think of that as an effort of being disruptive or of uh, to interrupt what's happening and to de-escalate the tensions in the moment. Um, I, I certainly understand the dangers in that. Um, and you know, clearly the, the police saw it as very dangerous. Um, you know, the unpredictability of a group like that. But I think that there are things that can be done to de-escalate situations and work at differences so that can be predictable. And to be honest, the only reason that I didn't go into that group was because I didn't recognize anybody. Um, I didn't know anybody in that, in that group of uh, mostly men. Um, and I think if I had known at least one of them, I would, have, I would have made my way over there. I think those women that did that knew some of those men that were in that group. And that's why they were trying to. So uh, the following day, uh, uh, this is the day after now, a group of local artists, um, the ones who many of them had been living in the downtown area, um, cleaned up the streets from the broken glass. Um, they, they began to paint murals on the plywood of the windows that had been boarded up. Um, but again, uh, there were no elected officials present on that day to organize or participate in the cleanup. Um, the, while local artists were cleaning up and painting those murals, uh, which were beautiful, um, the elected officials were actually meeting to make arrangements to bring in the state guard, um, which again seemed, um, I know that it sounded like there was a lot of turmoil, but it, I think in the grand scheme of things seemed like an over, um, seemed like doing too much. Anyway, I, I think I understand the challenges of local officials and what they're up against. Uh, I'm going to talk about that here in a bit. Um, but I just was very disappointed in what had been an ongoing and still is, I think, a failure of leadership in the community. Um, and certainly not that I thought I was the answer to that or that I could make everything great. Um, you know, I may be a pastor, but I don't have a messiah complex. Like, um, but I, I just couldn't help see the possibility of, of doing things differently. So, um, so then this decision to run. Um, Came up, um, you know, my uh, my initial response um, to this very kind of chaotic march or turn into a protest. Uh, my initial response to that was to reach out and bring together leaders or activists in the community. Um, one of them I knew um, some somewhat well. I'd gotten to know one of them, and so I worked with that one, and uh, we were able to identify about five or six um, people who are leaders or activists in the community um, to start to collaborate on how to move forward from that event. So, um, you know, we had a city government that was cut off from the community, in my opinion, um, community leaders who at the time were not really skilled in community development and were struggling to find ways to effectively relate to city officials. And then residents who, um, who didn't turn out to vote. Um, we just had an election or a, it was a runoff election, like a primary here in Aurora. There were 7,800 uh, voters in one of the wards that had this runoff and the, the top vote getter got uh, 290 votes. Um, I, my, um, the campaign that I ran had the lowest voter turnout um, in the years that I had tracked uh, the turnout. And, uh, and, and it was COVID, so it was a very difficult time, but, but certainly, and this is not unique to Aurora, that, that people are not very engaged in, in this process um, um, in a lot of ways. So, so this group, about five or six, mostly uh, black and brown people, uh, they're all younger than me, um, but they were very interested in addressing problems in the city as community leaders, but not as elected officials. They, um, Allison and I actually hosted them. My wife, Allison, and I hosted them over to our house for, for a meal. Um, we, we had several meetings together, uh, many of them around food. Um, and then this group, um, in fairly short order, planned another protest that was at a local park that was very well organized. Uh, they had all of the logistics worked out. They had assigned 
responsibilities to different people. Um, each of them spoke about their vision of Aurora and the problems they saw, how they thought they needed to be addressed. Um, they had trained people to be kind of security uh, for the group that gathered. Um, I thought they just did a really excellent job, um, which was a, a wonderful alternative to what had happened. Um, and it was at that protest, at that meeting, that someone asked me if I'd be interested in running for alderman, uh, someone from my ward. Um, and I had, you know, always had an interest in politics, uh, but I had never thought about running. Um, and especially not growing up in Aurora or being from there, I didn't really think about doing that. Um, but then I decided to do what I kind of normally do when I try to make decisions was I initially I sat down, I put on the paper, started thinking about, you know, why would that be important to me? Is that something I really want to do? Um, and thinking about uh, my own values and beliefs and uh, whether I thought that was something that I would be interested in. And then I took those ideas and I bounced them off lots of brains. So I bounced kind of my thinking about that, if I was gonna do that, I, I bounced that off of those activists. Um, I talked to other residents of the ward. Um, I had a conversation with my church leadership and board because clearly it would affect uh, the congregation. Um, uh, my parents, um, spent a lot of time talking to my parents about it, uh, my spouse and my extended family members. Um, and I thought about my core beliefs and principles uh, that would guide me through an election, um, would guide me through being an alderman if I was elected. Um, and so I, I, by the end of that summer, I actually decided to run. Um, so I spent the late summer months and the early fall um, just happened to stumble upon a campaign class that someone in a community next to us uh, was offering online. Again, this was during COVID. Uh, and that class lasted about three months before I had to, to declare that I was going to run and get signatures. Uh, and so that class also gave me an opportunity to figure out if that was something that I wanted to do. Um, I'm just going to be honest that campaigning was, was very rough. Um, we were in the middle of the pandemic. Um, there was, um, uh, this was early winter 2020, uh, early 2021, I don't know if you remember, but the vaccine was just being rolled out and it was just about to be administered to hospitals and school personnel. Um, it was impossible to meet with people in groups at that time. Um, and, and going door to door was tricky. Uh, some people refused to open their doors, um, even though I was wearing a mask and standing outside uh, about 10 feet away, um, using a very loud voice so they could hear me. I mean, I tried to engage people at the doors to talk to them. Uh, some people would come out and talk. Uh, there were uh, lots of people who just, for good reason, didn't want to talk. Um, I will say I had the best yard signs. Um, it's the only time in the talk I'm going to brag. You can actually Google them. I think if you Google like John Bell yard sign. I hope you will. I, I just think they look amazing. I, uh, I had some people working on that, and I, I just thought they turned out fantastic. Um, and then what I learned on the campaign trail sort of confirmed my observations about the city and the aldermen. That, um, and again, Aurora is not unique in this way, but they were very unresponsive to the everyday needs and concerns of residents. Um, and certainly some people I talked to had individual issues with their property or with the city, but gosh, there were uh, lots of, there are lots of neighborhoods in the ward. Um, it's a large ward. I think uh, it's, there are eight wards in Aurora. So if you take the 180,000 divided out by eight, um, you know, they're very large uh, wards. And so there are lots of distinct neighborhoods. And as I would walk these different neighborhoods, um, you know, I would find out that there were these neighborhood problems. For example, one neighborhood had a street where uh, traffic would just uh, soar, fly down the road, um, up, way above the speed limit. There would be lots of accidents. Um, and some of those residents had tried to get the city to do something about it, but the city never really um, did much. Uh, the police put up one of those speeding 
monitoring devices let you know what your speed is, but they, they really didn't do much about it. And so as I kind of walked through that neighborhood, that came up over and over again. There was another neighborhood um, where uh, parking was an issue on the street. It sort of gotten out of control. And so the way that the city dealt with it was to just, um, was to take away all of the street parking, uh, which created a problem. These were, um, these were apartment complexes and, and many of the residents uh, were dependent on family members who would come and stay with them during the day to provide care and now they had no place to, to park. So there were just lots of examples of where neighborhoods would have issues, uh, but they were having a difficult time getting sort of any kind of um, support that would um, be beneficial to the neighborhoods. Um, in some ways the city would feel like they were dealing with it, but the neighbors would still be left with lots of problems afterwards. Um, I have also been trained in asset-based community development, um, which I think has places of intersectionality with Bowen Center or with Bowen Theory. Um, I, I think they complement each other at a societal level. Um, it's, it's really the effort. Asset-based is about, instead of looking at needs-based, it's looking at the assets that people have um, more than just financial, but the things that people bring to relationships, to neighborhoods. Um, and organizing people together to collaborate around common issues and concerns. But it's, it's looking at the assets that are in, within the neighborhoods and community that already exist that can help solve problems. I decided that if I was elected, I was interested in hiring people to work in these neighborhoods to identify these common challenges and to bring together neighbors and city officials to create processes for addressing these concerns. There, I mean, there's been research that indicates that when neighborhoods are able to work collaboratively together with city officials that the overall well-being of the neighborhood increases. Um, the city does offer neighborhood meetings, but they're poorly attended, uh, poorly advertised, um, and they're not really programmed to do this kind of work. Um, the city does not invite neighbors to participate in problem solving. The city often takes responsibility for trying to solve these problems um, and often doesn't aren't able to do it. So, um, so I saw the cutoff between the city government, the local community organizers, and especially residents. Um, I saw that as part of the problem. That, uh, and I think it's a common problem for many municipalities that institutions like governments tend to silo their efforts uh, because, in some reason, in some ways, because of competing interests and revenue. Uh, but they're there was also an unwillingness uh, on the alderman's part to, to know the needs and be responsive to the needs of their uh, constituents. I heard that over and over again uh, uh, when I was on the campaign trail. So, um, so I tried to address that in, uh, I won't bore you with my uh, stump speech, but um, I tried to address that in the door-to-door -door conversations, the phone conversations that I was having uh, with people that I was able to have contact with about Addressing, uh, addressing that problem to be more available, more responsive, um, not to necessarily solve the problems, but to work at the connectedness, to being connected um, uh, to the community. Um, like I said, uh, none of those ideas, as great as I think that they are, um, won the election. So I, I didn't win. And it was very difficult to build momentum uh, in the middle of COVID. Um, and I would have other uh, elected officials and prominent community leaders say that they supported me in private, but were unwilling to say it publicly because, you know, if I lose and they still have to relate and need the incumbent to help do projects and things, they didn't want to sever that relationship, which was very interesting to watch. Uh, it was kind of a chicken and egg thing for me as I as I was campaigning, trying to get uh, some support that way. Anyway, uh, even though I didn't win, um, I, I did have some ideas about how I was gonna try to function in that position. Um, and, and so I'll just sort of end with this uh, last piece, which is that, um, uh, and some of this is influenced by David Sloan Wilson, uh, who's done work on pro-social and the neighborhood project. I, I heard Dr. Wilson speak at a conference here at the Bowen Center. Um, you know, the problem as I saw it, um, at, a, at an emotional level, government is part of a larger system in the societal emotional process. Um, that institutions have uh, 
grown out of a way to, this is me thinking about this, um, that, that institutions have grown out of a way to address emotional process as populations have increased. That institutions serve a function to manage the distribution and access of shared resources. And so as, as family emotional process intensifies, um, or becomes maybe com compounded, which, which can be the result of changes in these environmental resources that are shared, that institutions are often left to manage the quality and quantity of that spillover from families and emotional process. That's sort of one of the ways I think about that. And that as anxiety rises in the community, that these institutions become more and more siloed can become more and more siloed or cut off from the communities they serve and also other institutions in reactivity to the anxiety that rises in communities. That, that local government can operate in many ways, and this is true for I think every institution, but local government can operate in many ways separate and apart from the community and, and seek limited input from citizens and then make decisions that are not in the best interest of the people who elected them or the resource, the people who, um, whose resources they are to share. And, and then it has to do with the, I think the level of intensity of the residents who engage in these policy decisions and attend community meetings. And then it also has to do with the level of functioning of the elected officials. I think that's the same process that goes on in family functioning. Uh, and I, I, family, you know, how families function. And I, and I also think it happens at a societal level, uh, specifically in institutions as they interact uh, with family. So I was interested in having more presence and interaction with each neighborhood in the ward as a leader, uh, to be able to identify leaders in the neighborhood. Um, and by the way, like I, I do this now anyway, like even though I'm not, <laughs> even though I didn't win the election, I, I mean, I, this is the work I continue to do, um, but to identify leaders in each neighborhood. Um, and I did that on the campaign trail, which was a, a great use to me. I was able to have access that way. Um, and, and so I was able to identify key people in each of the neighborhoods. Um, but I was interested in developing a process for addressing sort of these common problems that neighborhoods are facing. Um, there's a lot of research that suggests that, you know, the more that one knows their neighbors, the more that they interact with the people that they live around, that the more likely they are to do better in the faces of challenges. Um, I mean, this is sort of a, a, a simplistic example, but in the case of a tornado, um, you know, if, if you're, if someone in your household is on a machine that provides sort of life-saving, uh, is life-saving and the power goes out and you don't have like a generator, you know, if, if you know somebody who has a generator in your neighborhood uh, or you know your neighbor has one, you're more likely than to, to be able to use it and to survive. So that's a very sort of oversimplistic example, but it's the importance of knowing your neighbor can be life-saving. So, my plan, um, and again, I, I still do this, even though I'm not elected for it, but I, I do walk around neighborhoods um, and I do try to identify people in neighborhoods. Um, again, to be present and accounted for and having good contact. Um, but the hope was that using the resources of a local government or a city government to, to resource neighborhood leaders, um, I was interested in helping them identify challenges, but then also channel money and community resources, staffing, uh, and the government to, to those neighborhoods to address those challenges. Um, aldermen receive a, 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 what is it, like a pool of money that they can spend in each of their wards, and most of them don't spend it or don't use it. Um, and it would be a great opportunity, I think, um, I never understood why nobody uses it, uh, but it, I think it's just a great opportunity for neighborhoods to come together and come up with ways to solve common problems. Um, and then, um, and then to the extent possible, um, this was the thing I was actually most interested in um, and probably most excited about. I never really talked about this when I was campaigning because I don't think anybody else would have appreciated it, but I was, um, um, I was interested in developing 
uh, and working on developing a one-to-one -one working relationship with each alder person, uh, with each staff member and the mayor, and to find a way to meet with them regularly, uh, kind of one-to-one -one setting and working on those angles and relationships. And I was interested to see what difference, if any, it would make that if I was working on differentiation of self within the context of setting policies and creating budgets and setting priority and setting priorities, if working on differentiation would actually make a difference in the way that government would would run itself. And so I I have a lot of questions about that. Uh, again, I you know not winning, I didn't really get to implement this, um, but. The questions for me remain as to, you know, what would what would you track for that effort? Like what what public data could be tracked? Um, what can one observe about the changes in city council meetings, how those are run, uh, changes in how the behind the scenes negotiations go uh, for city council? You know, how would one measure the level of tension among city government officials? Um, but I, you know, I never got that far um, uh, to do that. Um, and, um, and what would be the extent to which one could measure the differences it would make to, to city governments and, and to a city and to residents? Um, so I'll just end by saying, I'm, I don't have any uh, plans on running again. Um, and that has to do more with the fact that I'm, I'm actually moving to a new state in June. I'm, I'm moving to Louisville, Kentucky this June. Um, but I, I am interested still in public policy. Um, I'm, I'm interested in public policy, particularly as it relates to poverty. Um, that'd probably be worth another whole discussion sometime um, about thinking systems uh, and public policy around poverty. Um, but my opinion is that poverty is a policy decision. Um, anyway, I'll be interested in connecting with groups uh, in Louisville that are working on poverty at a, at a policy level. So that's my, that's my presentation. All right, thank you, John. Um, for folks who have uh questions or want to share your thinking, if you can use the uh, raise hand function in the in the reactions bar at the, depending on how you're using Zoom at the bottom or at the top. Uh, and we'll go from there. John, I do have one question for you while we wait for people to raise hands. Um, did you, was there any effort for you to, to maintain or uh, contact with the guy who, or the person who won. Uh, how did you think about the, <laughs> the incumbent? How did you, th how did you think about that? I know you're moving now, but I was curious to. Yeah, well, um, you know, I, I didn't, um, I, in the campaign, I didn't really focus much on the alderman. I just focused on, um, you know, what I was, what I was going to do. Um, and we had lots of debates, not lots, we had some debates and I, you know, I, I didn't really focus on them or their responses. I just tried to articulate kind of my best thinking about things. Um, and after the election, I, I called him and congratulated him, you know, on his um, on his win. And I've called him a couple of times about things going on in the community, you know, that I thought um, needed to be addressed. I was concerned about. So yeah, I still I still communicate and talk with him. All right, uh, Harold Bucket. You're muted, Harold. Okay, okay, got it, got it. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, John, for your presentation. I, I, I appreciate uh, just hearing about your journey uh, to, um, my question to you is, uh, what did you learn about yourself as a self-differentiated person uh, as you engage in this political process? And, 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 and what did you learn about yourself? And, and, and what does that say about to you? And secondly, um, did you ever find a way to engage the local clergy uh, in terms of trying to Get them to uh, impact public policy with 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 the leadership of the community, with the mayor and the aldermans and all that, uh, in terms of 
getting the clergy involved, but did you ever get involved with the clergy or did you just work with the community organizers uh, as, as, uh, as, as a community leader? Well, did you, you clear yeah, I mean, up? yeah, great questions. Well, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, great questions. Um, what I learned about myself is that this stuff is just extremely What I learned about myself is that <laughs> this stuff is just extremely complicated. I'm getting a little bit of feedback. I don't know um, where that's coming from, but um, it's it, good now. Yeah, it's extremely complicated. I mean, I I don't know. It's a like it is a workout like to try to work at relating, you know, and politics and and it. It's, people are just very, <laughs> very anxious, um, and um, um, uh, and stressed out. It, you know, it's just it's challenging. I, I guess I've just realized how challenging it is. And I, I probably have more questions than answers about, you know, how one works at defining a self and be engaged in these policy conversations, um, because it's. I mean, they're intense on the one hand, um, you often get people who have life experiences who champion a lot of some of this stuff and um, it, it, it can get kind of intense. And so, you know, I've, I've had questions for myself about what does it mean to be a community leader working on differentiation, but also like having one foot in differentiation and the other foot in, in all of the upheaval that goes on in the community and all the challenges that are going on. Um, I, I do work with clergy and in fact, um, you know, I run into this trying to think about how to, how I want to navigate or organize myself or relate to um, other community leaders, you know, without sort of getting wrapped up in all the emotional process, but also having something to offer. Anyway, the long, the short answer to that is uh, we just passed uh, the Safety Act in Illinois. And part of that was something called the Pretrial Fairness Act, which uh, ends money bond uh, bail in Illinois. Um, and so I've been um, at the state level working with faith community leaders um, and organizations to get that passed. Uh, and, you know, it did get passed. Um, but, um, yeah, it's just challenging. I mean, um, yeah, it's just challenging. Are, do you, do you do any of that work? Oh, I think you're muted. It yeah, I have done some work with with the community and I, as the local clergy. Uh, I'm retired now, of course, uh, but I have been involved with a community with community organizing and work with the local clergy to uh, to to try to make changes. I mean, right now we have a problem here in Atlanta with gun violence. Uh, it seems to be running rampant, and uh, the the pastors are now trying to get involved in terms of impacting the local uh, mayor and, 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 and the Senate councilmen about how we can make a difference in the community to change this uh, thing around with, with gun violence. And uh, it's, 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 it's a problem. Uh, but and I haven't how, been, lately. Yeah. I've been, plus some other things I've been doing, but yes. Okay, yeah. okay. well, thanks. So, okay, well, thanks. Okay, yeah. Thank you. All right, uh, Stephanie Ferrer. Ms. Ferreira. Oh, thank you, John. That was, it was very interesting to hear you uh, go through the, the different steps in your decision to make that commitment. I think it's, I think it's a brave thing to do. <laughs> and uh, it was interesting to hear about the family um, influence and how you're you grew up with parents who had shown interest in um, the the societal issues and the government and all that. So I, I, I guess my question kind of came up at the point that you <clears throat> were saying the people in the neighborhoods 
seemed to be, it, 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 did you sense that they felt disconnected from government? That government was a group of people who managed taxes and money and revenue and uh, made decisions and that it was mostly involved uh, contractors and people who were going to carry out um, the the decisions. <laughs> it, 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 I get the sense that there was kind of a, a disconnect there, that there, there wasn't a sense of of community and sense of the neighbor feeling any agency about what they could how in their relationship with the government. Yeah, I think that's accurate. And and I would say too that that often when local community members try to organize something, that um, it becomes very it, it becomes challenging. I mean, there's in some ways um, the city will take well in some ways it over functions it just takes on responsibility for some of the initiatives that get started in the community in neighborhoods that the city will step in and try to uh, put a version of that together um, almost almost as if it's replacing the the, the neighborhood initiatives mm -hmm. so yeah I think people don't feel like it's working in their favor um, <clears throat> that it's it it doesn't have their best interest in mind. Yeah. And where I live, um, and, and I'm in Oak Park, which is considered a very vi uh, vibrant uh, community with a high level of engagement uh, of people. But um, there have been many, it's, they've, they've, there's been a, a, a strong uh, priority placed on development. There have been a great many buildings built in the last decade or two. <clears throat> and in a number of cases, the uh, trustees, before approving the development plan, will go through the historical committee and they'll list and neighbors will organize and petition against <laughs> the development. Right. And it'll all be in the local newspaper. But in the at the end of the day, the trustees will approve the development. Right. <laughs> and that that seems to be the pattern. Uh, that when it comes to the actual government decision, um, much of it is based on what's uh, you know what's going to bring in more taxes, what's more profitable economically, and a neighborhood. Um, groups uh, usually don't, the, the voices are not strong enough to overcome the, um, you know, so uh, I, I wonder, I, I've kind of sensed a, a, a lack of, a lack of trust and or diminishing trust in government uh, in general. Um, and and pe people feeling like uh, they're you you it's maybe sort of a David and Goliath kind of relationship. I don't I don't know if yeah. you concur with that, John. Well, and I think um, you know one of the pieces that I keep kind of keeping in front of me is that people are so disengaged in the political process in general, and. You know how do you, you know people just aren't motivated i mean i people just tell me they're not voting anymore you know that they don't want to they don't want to vote it doesn't matter um and you know from a systems perspective you know it's to me it's sort of like well who 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 makes the first move you know who who shifts that and um uh yeah it's i i think that that's right um, but then, um, you know, what's a average citizen supposed to do with that? You know, they can go out and vote, uh, but then what do you do with the fact that there are all these people that are not voting, um, who, who don't trust and don't think it makes a difference? Yeah, I, it's a complicated problem. Um, and there certainly doesn't seem to be any leadership around it. 
and and you did find that in Aurora, the percentage who voted was quite low. Yes, especially in the local local elections, or yep. this, you know. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Stephanie. All right, uh, Kirk Morrison. Hi, John. I checked out your uh, election signs here. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I did the Google search, and that was the very first thing that uh, that popped up. And uh, it's the loss certainly doesn't look like it was for lack of creativity and on yeah, the marketing thanks. effort side. Um, I've been in municipal government uh, for uh, over 15 years on the administrative side. And so applying Bowen theory to uh, local government and governments in general is something that, uh, you know, that I think a lot about. Um, and one of the things when I talk to elected officials um, uh, in my capacity as a chief administrative officer about what got them interested in running, and it is very often what you described as uh, I, I didn't have a specific interest in running, however, I was approached to say, you know, um, would you consider uh, running? And and so, what do you think it is about you that uh, this individual thought that uh, you would be a a good candidate to run the city? Yeah, we were. Um, well, I think that that the initial person that had the conversation with me knew that I was very involved with the community in terms of building relationships with a lot of different leaders. And these would be the unelected leaders of the community I mean, the activists and organizers and people who are um, running different organizations. And so I'm, I, I've spent so much of my time in Aurora trying to build good relationships with all the different leaders in the, in the town. I think that was a piece of it. Um, my interest in the conversation context we were having was my interest was, I don't know if you remember, I was talking about those artists who came into the downtown area, painted these beautiful murals over all of these broken windows on this, on this plywood. My interest was in setting up an educational building in downtown Aurora that was dedicated to solving social problems and that putting those murals up in the buildings. Uh, inside for people to see like it would be a center for people to come and to work on how do we address community problems um, that and that was the conversation we were having and and then that person said you know you should you should run so and then and, and that wasn't the only person there were a couple other people who also kind of uh, uh, poked me in that direction too um, but that was the first conversation that we had that made me start thinking about it Interesting. Yeah, I could. Uh, I see. There's a couple other hands up, but I could. How, uh, talk but I'm interested. Uh, where Where do you see, like, in the work that you're doing, where do you see, like, the benefits of working on differentiation, in in the ways that you relate to all the? I mean, you're relating to so many different people with so many different interests and uh, responsibilities. I mean, how do you how do you think about that? Yeah, I think. Uh, from the perspective of the elected officials, uh, that it is extraordinarily important to um, um, define self at that table. And uh, the, the challenge always becomes um, defining self as a representative. You're representing the people. And so how do you find that balance between uh, representing your own um, uh, principles, values, direction, and representing the will of the people. And it sounded like you made a fairly concerted effort to um, do the door um, uh, banging, find out what the issues were, mm -hmm. um, parking, speeding, you know, uh, those kinds of things. So I've observed that uh, um, um, uh, tension between representing self and representing your constituents. Uh, so, so that's something I think about specifically within terms of differentiation of self. And the other thing that I hear so often is um, that that's all well and good and that healthy debate is great. Um, 
but once council makes a decision for the city as a whole and it may be voted you know five aldermen to four in favor of that now this becomes the city's direction and um i've thought a lot about that about if you are uh, part of a elected city council and a direction that you feel strongly about doesn't go your way how do you reconcile this um putting that aside and having the will of council become uh, the direction that your community is going so uh i think it's a i think it's a challenging this being an elected official is a challenging uh arena to exercise uh, differentiation and balance the individuality and, and togetherness forces thanks yeah thanks Okay, I just put I just put a link to the yard sign and that's for people, John, so they can take a look. Um, just because I wouldn't want them to miss it. So, uh, right. Rand Randy Frost. John, thanks uh, for your presentation and um, hey, trying, trying to bring uh, Bowen theory to the public square. Hmm. Uh, how close was the election? How how far did you fall short? Um, I you know I got about half of what the other had, so it wasn't too bad. But it wasn't too what you need, but yeah. yeah, yeah. But it was a really low turnout, so um, yeah, it just made it that much more challenging. Right. How did you think about uh, applying the? concepts of differentiation and the theory to the actual process of campaigning. Um, you know, uh, emotion seems to stir people. Uh, how did you integrate your policy ideas and the thinking that went into them with um, some degree of, of emotion uh, as well, or was it strictly a kind of cerebral effort that uh, you made with your material, your platform, your stump speech, and so forth? Yeah. Um, I, when I was going door to door, I was interested in uh, I was interested in talking about the things that I thought were important to as a resident and then also as a person serving in that role and then I was also interested in what they were thinking about you know like what what were the issues that they were I mean what were the challenges they were experiencing um, what was going well, what wasn't going well. I mean, I was just interested in in what they were thinking about and mm -hmm. how they thought about politics or the city. Um, and, you know, that doesn't take long for people, for most people to get going on it, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> to say what they really think about the whole, the whole operation. Um, but I was really interested and I, you know, I took notes, um, not in front of people, but I mean, I, I did take notes about what people were talking about um, and I, I would, you know, I would think about, well, what am I trying to do? What am I interested in? What are people saying? You know, I was trying to figure out, you know, where, where, how do I need to shift the way I'm thinking about this or looking at this, but also what are pieces that I think are really important that maybe other people disagree with, but that I still want to hold on to, um, okay. because I think it's just the right thing. Right. I mean, it's a, that's a, that's a challenging, I think that's sort of what the last conversation was about too. I mean, how, you know, you have to evaluate, you're constantly evaluating kind of what you think is important, what other people are telling you is important and how much you think that is important. You know, I don't, it, it it's an ongoing conversation. Mm -hmm. So, so a lot of your, um, electioneering was person to person, door to door mm -hmm. conversation. On the phone, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Did you give any speeches? 
No, there was really no, um, I had to get creative uh, with social media. So social media became a way to give sort of short speeches. Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't think I could hold people's attention long enough, but I would give kind of, I, every now and then I'd give sort of a short speech. Um, okay. But yeah, it was, it was hard in the pandemic to really get out to a critical mass of people and to really engage people around what, what the city needs. Right. One other question. You know, political parties often uh, play a big part in uh, <clears throat> who gets and who loses. Was the um, political makeup of your uh, ward mostly one party or the other? And how did that affect your ability to make coalitions and maybe even run a slate of candidates right. in different ways. Yeah, it's so interesting. They're, these are uh, non-political, uh, I forget what the terminology is, but they're not party affiliated races. So there, there are no party politics. I mean, there are party politics in Aurora, but the, the campaigns are not, uh, you don't run as a Republican or Democrat or independent or whatever. Um, you don't have to declare that, um, but you can tell, I mean, you can just tell in the ways that people vote and talk and uh, you get a good sense of that. Um, but uh, yeah, there, it was, um, you know, there were, there, there were people who wanted to build sort of these coalitions um, I decided not to do that. There was a couple of candidates who were trying to do that and I decided not to. Um, I, you know, there are benefits to that. I didn't see a benefit to it. Um, and that's another, you know, then the question is how do you evaluate that in terms of a level of togetherness, you know, that goes on? I mean, I don't know, it's complicated, but um, um, I don't know, do you have any thoughts about that? No, I was just musing. Um, I guess it, it's similar to trying to define a self in any group of people. Um, you know, whether it's you're part of a political party and it's campaigning or um, even a nonpartisan election where you might form a coalition with other like minded as far as you can tell candidates that could put forth a kind of a consistent message um but it would have something to do with defining a self and staying connected with your uh, your running mates if you had a larger slate um mm -hmm. on broader themes that um might attract more attention for each candidate uh, than them running individually or as isolates. Yeah. yeah. I don't know why this got me thinking about it. What you were just said got me thinking about this, but mm -hmm. you know, I think that you know when you get uh, when you sit down and talk to an elected official and they start explaining to you what they're trying to do, it all makes sense like you hear what they're up against, you know, and that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then you, and then you go and talk to a staff person at the city council and the challenges they're having, um, present company excluded, you know, and then that all, uh, you know, that all makes sense too. And then I go and talk to somebody in my neighborhood about their frustration about the city and the thing, and that all makes sense too. Like, you know, when you get down to it and you start talking to people individually, like what they're up against makes sense. The, the problem, is as I was sort of observing it and have sort of come to think about it, is that no nowhere in society are those conversations all happening together. Mm -hmm. You know, like a, a, an honest conversation. And sometimes I think you can get it from some elected officials. Well, they'll tell you, you know, well, this is what I'm. I've I've been in in meetings with elected officials talking about a policy and. And they'll just be honest with me about what they're up against. But you know, there aren't very many spaces where 
people get to hear what each other's up against and trying to and to respect and understand sort of what the other is trying to do. And, you know, it's a similar thing in families, I suspect. Um, mm. But that just, and, and so my interest was in some ways to figure that out a little bit. Like, you know, what, what do you do with that reality? Um, because everybody's kind of got a piece of the problem sorted out, but they don't have the full thing. And I think if, if more people were to come together around these problems, and we're to work collaboratively talking about what they're up against, I think we'd get some better solutions. I don't know, that's kind of the way I think about it, something like that. And the, the kind of um, tone that was set at those meetings by whoever. Exactly. Make yeah. a huge difference, wouldn't it? Absolutely, yep. Yeah. Well, um, I uh, used to live uh, in the center of, Indiana, about maybe an hour, an hour and a half from Louisville. That is an interesting town politically. So I think you're going to have fun. <laughs> I'm sure I'll have fun. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Um, Har Harold Bucket. Uh, yes. Yes, John. Uh, you 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 raised an interesting interesting point about um, people being. Um, not interested in voting anymore. I think what I'm finding is people are getting, I think this country is getting exactly what it really wanted. It, 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 this, it seems to be an attempt to disenfranchise so many voters on a lot of different levels. I mean, you know, with the Voting Rights Act here in Georgia, I mean, we couldn't, you know, they were trying to get people to not give water to people who are in line waiting to vote and so forth and so on. So I think, you know, when you find people not really, really interested in voting, I mean, that's what, maybe that's what the country's moving toward, uh, trying to disenfranchise voters. And and, and maybe they, they don't want people to vote and subsequently people are not voting. And, and people just are very cynical about it. And it, you know, that seems to be the way things are going to be. Uh, you know, I, I, that's my comment about that in, in terms of uh, why people are not voting. I, 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 I appreciate that. I think that's right. I mean, I think that's exactly I, right. And I guess the only thing that I would add to that for myself is I think that people, um, when they see what's going on around them, um, it stresses them out. You know, like in my position, I'm always trying to encourage people to get more engaged in the problems that are going on. And people are reluctant to do that. Um, so I think you're right about the ways in which policy sort of creates a system that gets what it what it's designed to do, right? Um, but I also think that um, it's just a lot easier and calmer for people to not have to try to step into some of these really stressful, tense problems that we're facing um, and to understand the problems, you know, to understand the uh, how people are being disenfranchised as voters, to understand uh, the problems uh, and the challenges of policing or, you know, to understand whatever the local community problems are that People, I, I think it's the reactivity, it's an emotional process to me, it's the reactivity that people have to the challenges that we face. And some people do a better job than others at managing that and leaning into the problems. Um, I'm always on the side of encouraging people to lean into the challenges, um, but it's, it's hard for people to do. We're having a problem here in, in Georgia, where in Atlanta, where the the city is trying to carve out, they're, they're trying to carve out a city within a city. Uh, it, it was easier for to carve out a city within an unincorporated uh, area, but now we're trying to carve a city out of out of a city, which creates a whole 
a set of problems. And and but what I'm also finding out about that is that the level of there's such a high level of anxiety that it it, it, it it's it's preventing people from having a to be able to reasonably think about what's going on and why they're doing what they're doing. Uh, you know, there's you know, so if, if people are just not caring because it's such, there's so so much anxiety and, and such anxiousness that they 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 can't even think about what 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 the reasonable uh, responses are in terms of addressing these problems in the city because they're numerous, they're complex and they're numerous and and they're widespread and mm-hmm. they're layered. So we have a we have a we have a serious problem of what's going on here. And yeah, you have your work. You have your work cut out for you. Uh, you know, and yeah, you have your work. You have your work cut out for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, thank you so much. Thank you very much for your your presentation today. Thank you. All right, we got about ten minutes left. I'll see if we can get to everybody, but we'll keep it moving. Uh, Rob, don't know your last name. You're you're muted. Alrighty, is that better? Can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, as someone with uh, with roots in community organizing for a number of years, I really appreciate this conversation and uh, and your own uh, transparency and your openness. I know that comes with this as a matter of course, but um, it's it's very stimulating to me. So that's that's the first thing I want to say right off the bat. Randy, Randy, your comments um, also stimulated this in me, and I wanted to share it with you. Um, uh, and I don't know if Randy necessarily intended this or uh, had these assumptions. Um, I think about this kind of thing, if a community can coalesce and define itself, I think it has a better chance at influencing people in power. And a well-defined leader, um, I think of it as a well-defined leader who can connect with that community, can in fact engender that kind of differentiation within the community where people are begin to, to establish their own clarity. Um, what I'm wondering about is as you think back on your own experience, um, how would you assess and how did you think about, uh, in hindsight, I realize, your own efforts at not just defining yourself in terms of you know, where you stand on a number of issues, but in the ways in which you attempted to connect with the, the constituency that you wanted? Is that making sense? Yeah. Um, I don't know if this answers that. Uh, question, but uh, I mean, I think over time, there's a, a, a somewhat level of confidence that you develop as a person. And then, yeah. and then, you know, whether or not, I mean, this is kind of a Bowen thing, but whether or not somebody agrees with me, I was never, especially lately, not been really too worked up about whether or not people agree with me or my views. But I think what I am interested in is, um, working with people who are trying to work on something and sure. connecting them with resources in the community. Um, that to me, there's this disconnect or cutoff that people have around with resources in a community. Um, I think that's why I like the asset base that I was talking about earlier, but I, I also think that my, my work is just, I see myself as problem solving. I mean, that's kind of how I think about myself and that I'm, uh, working with people to help them uh, work on whatever it is that they're trying to accomplish uh, without, you know, I'm not interested in participating in it or doing it with them. But um, if if I have a resource or if others have resources that would be useful and want to work with them, then that's that's what I'm interested in. Um, it's the it's sort of the connectivity that I'm interested in. And, and um, I think that that's the communities need to get connected to each other because you can't work on differentiation until people have a have a live a live wire to work with, I guess, or you know, the, 
can't work on the, the differentiation until there's the connections going. And so that's that's the piece that I've been interested in working on. I don't know. That's that's kind of how I was yeah. thinking. That's my best shot at it. How how emotionally connected did you feel with them and do you believe they felt with you? Because that's what I wonder about. Mm -hmm. And uh I I that's that's a uh, that phrase emotionally connected can have so many connotations. I realize that. Yeah. But um I found myself wondering wondering about that because my own experience is that to get elected, if you will, to lead, that there's some element of that that seems intrinsic, like a critical variable. Yeah. Well, maybe that's why I lost. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I, don't, I was wondering how I was. I, I mean, it's a real question. Not yeah, I know. Wondering yeah. how. I don't. I don't think I have an answer for that. Yeah. It's yeah. a good question. I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'd have to think about how to frame an answer to that. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, if nobody has a burning question. Um, we'll wrap up. Thank Did you. Did you say a burning question or a burning question? <laughs> a burning question with a G. Um, Rob, we'll wrap a... up. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Thank you so much, John, uh, for sharing your experiences and thinking with us tonight. And hopefully uh, maybe you've inspired some other people <laughs> uh, to engage in and uh, some thinking about their, their relationship with their community as well. Yeah. Um, so the, the only thing I'll announce before we wrap up is for folks um, who are interested in attending the Bowen Center's spring conference, um, we have the info up. Uh, on the website now. Uh, the title of the conference is Family Violence, a Systems Perspective. And you can attend in person in Arlington, Virginia or online. And um, there is still the uh, early bird discount, discount right now for folks who register. So if you go to the bowencenter.org and uh, uh, Morgan just, uh, Smith just posted the link to the Eventbrite info as well. So you can just follow that link check it out and see if it's something you're interested uh, in being there for. So thank you all for joining us tonight um, and have a good weekend.